Son, Holy Spirit, Lord God, Amen. May the Lord bestow upon us His blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom now and ever to the age of ages. Amen. Uh, today is the fourth Sunday of the blessed month of Aviv, and uh, it's a familiar gospel, I'm sure, for a lot of us because we also read it on the day before the feast of Palm Sunday of the Lord's entry into Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the church also, as you know, places it on today, the, this Sunday. Uh, and this month, like we've been saying, is focused on the theme of we celebrate it in the very beginning of the month. So easy to remember, basically in terms of the structure of the year, we focus the first um, month on the love of God the Father, and then the, the next few months on the grace of his only begotten son, which includes um, the, the great Lent, the passion and the death and the resurrection of our Savior. And then around the Feast of Pentecost, we move to, to the work of the Holy Spirit um, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, like we say at the end of the liturgy. Um, and that includes the work of the Spirit in the Apostles. So we celebrated the apostles, the beginning of, of the month. And so the last um, four Sundays uh, have been focusing on the apostles and starting with their sending out, right, in the book of uh, the, the gospel according to St. Luke and their virtue where he says we have to be humble like the, the little children. And then um, how they participated in the blessing of the five loaves and two fish last week. And here, how they also participated in the resurrection of the friend of the Lord, uh, who was Lazarus. <clears throat> Not only how they participated, but the fathers teach us, and I think we've mentioned this before, that the, the sacrament of loosing and binding and moving the stone is related to, to, to the repentance and confession that was given uh, as uh, in the sacrament of priesthood um, to help loose and, and to heal and to resurrect the spiritually dead. <clears throat> so um, St. John, the beloved, as you know, uh, wrote his gospel uh, chronologically at the end of the other. The, so the, the first three came first chronologically, um, <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But St. John waited a period of time before writing his gospel, and he t intentionally um, selected cert not to repeat certain things. Um, but he also intentionally... Um, repeated certain things that was necessary for salvation. Like what? And we see this in the readings of the church, right? During Vascha, even during Palm Sunday, you read all four Gospels, right? Because St. John emphasized, and all of them emphasize the importance of this feast. <clears throat> of course, the resurrection without, um, without need to mention. Um, so St. John didn't like to repeat much, but when he did, it was very important. Um, uh, or, of course, everything in the gospel is, is of the utmost importance, but there's levels and degrees. <clears throat> so regarding miracles, how many miracles did St. John write in his gospel, 21 chapters or so? Seven. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and of those, um, fortunately, he doesn't write about the, the transfiguration, um, but he, uh, he focuses on, he ends with the resurrection of Lazarus. Um, this is the seventh one in, in the chapter here, the 11th chapter. <clears throat> and probably out of the seven, it was the greatest. Um, because as uh, St. Paul says in, in his res resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, the last enemy that is to be destroyed is death, right? So the last enemy that was destroyed in the gospel is death. Right? And in our life, hopefully, uh, is that <clears throat> this was, uh, or still is, um, the greatest fear of, of many people. Um, unfortunately, even some um, of, of the righteous. So the town of Bethany was where Lazarus, Martha, and Mary lived. It was a small town about a couple miles away from Jerusalem. And it was most likely the place where the disciples um, uh, brought the, the donkey for, for Palm Sunday where because he lodged and he stayed in Bethany, Bethany and was going back and forth between Bethany and Jerusalem during the last week uh, before the crucifixion. <clears throat> so um, as, 
uh, as the church teaches us, Lazarus, um, the, the friend of Jesus, right? He is, um, he is, he symbolizes here all of mankind, right? And, and, and the home of Lazarus, um, the home of man, right? Um, is a symbol of the whole world, <clears throat> right? Uh, so when the Lord comes to his friend who is dead in the tomb and even waits a period of time before going, um, and uh, he weeps over him, he, we, we can consider this, that he's weeping over all of us and all of mankind over the state that had overcome him, the state of death, which is the wages of sin, as, as the, the Holy Bible tells us. <clears throat> um, so in the church, when we, when we speak of sin and struggling against sin and the consequences of sin, um, this is a life and death matter, not just um, our living here, but it's a, sp a spiritual life matter. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'll connect this a little bit with the, the, the verse or the, the message in the book of Revelation of the fifth church. So how many, how many churches does St. John write in, to in Revelation? Seven, very good. Um, and the church of Sardis, um, it was a city in Turkey no, known for its wealth and its strong walls that protected it. And it was once a very powerful city. But after the first century or so, or by the, by the turn of the first century, it had fallen into a decline. <clears throat> um, and even in the church, they had declined spiritually. Um, so as you know, the seven messages, um, usually the Lord would start with a commendation and then um, a criticism um, or a, a directing the church to fix something and then a, a mentioning a reward that he would give to the people who heeded his message and who, who followed his instruction. <clears throat> but sometimes the Lord wouldn't mention anything wrong. And sometimes in this case, he wouldn't mention anything good, right? So in, in the book of uh, Revelation, the first uh, verse of chapter three, it says to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. He actually says this to all of them. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, <clears throat> but you are dead. Um, and this is the state that the Lord weeps over um, the people who think they are alive or are alive to some extent, but spiritually, they're, they're dead. Um, uh, it's kind of like um, when you see uh, someone in a coma or even like, you know, the zombies and the zombie movie, movies where they're like, um, they're moving, but you don't want to be near them, right? They're out of their mind and they don't know what they're doing. Right? And you don't even know what they're going to do. Right? You're scared of them, so in a sense. So the Lord is saying the person who is alive in this world, and they have a name, even they might call themselves Christian, but don't know the Lord, they're, they're dead inside. We don't, we don't want to, to dare to even be close to this type of person. <clears throat> and unfortunately, um, a lot of times we feel like we're, we're in this situation um, because... Um, sometimes we, we complain that our spiritual life is, is full of deadness. We can't uh, get ourselves to pray or we're not encouraged to read scripture regularly or we don't um, confess and repent or more repent as, as much as we should. Um, <clears throat> or even if we do all of that, our heart is still far from God. Um, and uh, this is, th definitely there's a difference between someone who is alive and struggling, and someone who is dead, right? There's a big difference, right? The person who is alive and struggling is in their right mind, and they're attempting, and they're getting up every time they fall, and, and they're, um, they're, they have hope that one day they will be victorious, right? Versus the other person who is out of their mind. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a common problem nowadays that we're, when we're going through the motions and mo moving around in the world doing this and that, um, and maybe even a churching, attending church now and then, but um, 
there's some people, they're not in their right mind, unfortunately. They're far from thinking about the spiritual things, about the heavenly things and the holy things. And so they're caught up in this worldly life. And this is what St. Paul talks about regarding the Romans. He says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So where's your mind? And I think that's the main question. Is your mind on the things only of this world and the things of, of the body or according to the spirit? He says, for to be carnally minded is death. Um, so we should take care not only what we do, but how we're thinking and what we're consuming our, our thoughts with. <clears throat> uh, and he said, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's no way um, because you're dead inside, right? Um, and so uh, hopefully this, this doesn't apply to us. But if, if some of it may, because when we're attached to sin and the wages of sin is death, then we're attached to some sort of death in us. Um, <clears throat> kind of like, you know, when um, you lose circulation, hopefully temporarily in, in a limb or something, it, it's numb. You can't move it, even if you want to, like we normally do. It's, it's almost, it's limp. It doesn't move, right? <clears throat> so what do we do in this situation? Right? As uh, taking the advice from the Lord in Revelation, um, actually the word Sardis means saved. So their name means saved, but they weren't living according to their name, right? Just like we are a Christian, um, and we can be called Christian, but not necessarily live a Christian life. Um, <clears throat> So he says what? He says, be watchful, right? Um, pay attention. Strengthen the things that remain, um, that are ready to die. So, so this death is a process, spiritually speaking, right? Um, and so uh, he says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Lift up your minds in a sense. Uh -huh. And um, hold fast and repent. So, so these are the, the basic directives that the church gives to us uh, often, um, but it's intentional because we, we don't want to die spiritually. We don't want to be like people just walking around in the world and doing this and that and very far from our Heavenly Father. How can that person expect to attain the kingdom of heaven, even if they're baptized, even if they've attended church every now and then? That's the, the, the gate is narrow. Um, so I know it's a, it's a difficult uh, message to accept, um, but we have to be serious when we look at these things in our spiritual life, um, because otherwise um, we don't want to hear that, that fearful voice saying, I do not know you. Um, <clears throat> so, so what else that we can do? The first thing that the Lord did before raising Lazarus um, is what? Even before he prayed. What does St. John say that he did? <coughs> it's, it's a thing that he did oftentimes in the gospel um, uh, or the, the evangelists intentionally put it, but it's easy to be glanced over. <coughs> um, he, it says when he, uh, when he lifted up his eyes, and then he said, Father, I thank you. And he said the prayer that you, that you he, have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but for the sake of the people standing, I, I say these. Uh, so he lifted up his eyes. <clears throat> he lifted up his eyes many times in the gospel. But why is this important, right? So <clears throat> according to the fathers, there's many reasons why um, the, the, the Holy Spirit moved the evangelist to write this phrase. So the first thing, we lift our eyes in prayer, right? As, as Origen says, we must carefully observe and examine what has been written according con concerning the position of Jesus' eyes. He said, he had changed his thought from his conversation with those below and lifted up and exalted it, bringing it in prayer to the Father who is over all. So then he says, the one who imitates Christ's prayer, lifting up the eyes of his soul and bringing them up in this way, from everyday concerns, memories, thoughts, and intention must in this way address God, right? So this is what we were saying, in order to make your mind um, focused on the heavenly and not the earthly, lift up your eyes, um, seek the Lord, contemplate on heaven, um, <clears throat> and by doing this, then you won't be dead, right? <clears throat> so um, 
uh, like the Psalms always remind us, unto you I lift up my eyes, or you who dwell in the heavenly place. Or I will lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help shall come. Right? <clears throat> so this is why we should at least try, not necessarily the eyes of our bodies, but the eyes of our souls to look to the Lord, uh, to see God and his creation and his power. And that's why the Lord kept emphasizing when he, he spoke with, with Martha, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God, right? Um, <clears throat> so those who believe see the glory of God, not just like in the transfiguration or um, see the heavenly beings, that, that's nice. But to see the glory of God in your life is a different thing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, it's not just a physical act or a form of prayer, but a lifestyle of putting your eyes on the Lord. Um, so we focus on the everlasting instead of the temporal, the eternal instead of the worldly. <clears throat> um, as Isaiah says in his uh, book, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath for the heavens will vanish away and like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment and those who dwell in it will die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever. So look at the things that remain, that are eternal, not the things that will fade away. Um, and those that things that we look, that's what we search for, that's what we live for. Um, <clears throat> and so St. Paul says it even um, more succinctly in Hebrews 12, where he says, looking to him, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who be began everything, and the one who completed everything. Um, and as St. John Chrysostom says, if we wish to run and look, sorry, to learn and run well, let us look at Christ, even to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He says, what is this? He has put the faith within us. For he says to the disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And Paul also says, but then I, shall I understand, even as I have been fully understood, he put the beginning into us. He will always put on the end. Meaning, God started the salvation for you. Um, he, he died and rose. Right? He already did everything he needs to do. And he even prepared the end for you. Right? And he placed, he says, he has put faith in, in, within us. Um, <clears throat> so just look to him. Um, you have the Holy Spirit inside you already. Right? Um, it's the, the spiritual struggle is much easier with the grace of God than it is before. Like, um, thankfully, we have the blessing of seeing a lot of people enter into the church and be, be baptized at a later stage in life um, <clears throat> than, than we're not typically uh, see. Um, and to see the grace of God working in the person after baptism is, is a beautiful thing. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes because a lot of us were born in this way, we kind of neglect the power of the Holy Spirit um, uh, too much um, <clears throat> and so um, to be a Lazarus to be the friend of God because uh, he was called the friend of the Lord right to be a Lazarus um, you have to set your eyes on on him on the author and the finisher of our, of our faith and you set your mind on the heavenly things and not the earthly <clears throat> um, and like just the fact like we know that the Lord loved him just in this gospel, it was mentioned three times, right? And it's not just, yes, he was a friend of the Lord, but as a symbol, he's, he's, he's my friend too, right? Um, uh, he whom you love is sick. Um, and then it said, now the Lord loved um, Martha and her sister and Lazarus, right? So it wasn't just him. It was, it was the group of, of the believers who were close to him. <clears throat> and even after he wept, he said, see how he loved him, right? So um, <clears throat> I'll conclude with this um, saying by um, one of the Orthodox uh, fathers or um, the priests who said, um, the power of the resurrection is not a divine power in itself, but he says it's the power of love, uh, or rather love as power. So when we see the resurrection of Lazarus, um, it's different than the resurrection of the Lord, right? Because um, the, the resurrection of Lazarus was a, a temporary one. He was brought back to the first life, um, not necessarily um, given the second life. 
Um, but anyway, he says, God is love and love is life. Love creates life. It is love that weeps at the grave. So when I say God doesn't care about me or uh, God forgot me or he's upset with me, no, that's not what he does at the tomb of the, the person who's dead, even spiritually dead. He weeps. Um, and and this, he says, this is the love that weeps at the grave and this is the love that restores life. He knew he was going to restore the life. Uh, just a few, so, but he cares. And and when I realize that he cares, um, when I look to him as the one who is the author and finisher of my faith and the one who loves me, then then I have all I need to, to grow in his grace. <clears throat> It says, this is the meaning of the divine tears of Jesus. In them, love is, is at work again, recreating, redeeming, restoring the darkness, life, the darkened life of man. Um, and then, then he calls us by name and says, come forth, come out of the darkness, come out of Hades, come out of death. Um, for I need, you are my friend, I need you to be with me um, forever. May the grace of the Lord give us this uh, storehouse of life, as St. Athanasius says, um, and to give us the grace to truly live with him, not only in the flesh, but in our minds and in our spirits, so that we may live with him forever. Glory be to the Lord from the age of our ages. Amen.